Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Over the weekend, Israel made a surprise launch of the OFEC-16 satellite. This was launched on board a Shavit-2 rocket, and it was billed as an Earth observation satellite. Really, it's a military reconnaissance satellite. Israel have been launching satellites on their own for quite a while. They actually started developing reconnaissance satellites uh, more or less after the 1973 Yom Kippur War, because U.S assets were not able to deliver the intelligence they wanted quickly enough for various reasons. So they uh, developed their own launch system and they've been running this since about 1988. So this is the ninth successful launch of an OFEC satellite. The last OFEC satellite launched was OFEC 11 and that was launched in 2016. We don't actually know what happened to OFEC 12 to 15, I suspect they might be part of some cancelled design or they might be getting launched later. I'm not really sure. Regardless, to satellite watchers, the OFEX satellites are kind of fascinating oddballs. So like all things launched from Israel, they're launched by the Shavit rocket and they're launched into a retrograde orbit. They're going the wrong direction around the Earth. So all of the spacecraft launched by Israel have a, an orbit that's roughly 142 degrees of inclination, which means they're sort of going uh, west or east to west rather than west to east. And yeah, this is highly unusual in space launch because, of course, going uh, west to east, you pick up the velocity of the Earth. But they need to do this because it's a, a requirement that they dr don't drop spent rocket stages on any of their neighbours to the east. They have Jordan, they have Saudi Arabia, various other nations to the east, which are which might have uh, not be happy if they drop something on them. Alternatively, Israel may not want these nations to be examining the spent rocket hardware. And that is another reason why they choose to launch over the Mediterranean. So all the launches occur from Pal Mashim Air Base, and then they head west out over the Mediterranean Sea. And it's believed if the rocket were able to launch eastwards, they would more than double their payload capacity. But even going west, they're actually very careful with their launch trajectories. They kind of try to stay over the Mediterranean as much as possible, practically aiming to thread the needle over the Straits of Gibraltar. That means they're carefully sliding between Europe and Africa. So the Shavit rockets are built by the Israel Aerospace Industries and the current version of this is the Shavit 2. And it's an evolution, obviously, of the original Shavit, which launched back in 1988. The design is an all-solid rocket motor design. It uses three solid rocket stages. The first two stages are practically identical. They're the same mass, the same diameter, the same length, but the second stage has a larger vacuum optimized nozzle. So on the original Shavit, the stages are 1.3 meters in diameter and 6.4 meters long, and the mass is about 10 tons, slightly different because of the different nozzle sizes. These Both these stages burn for 52 seconds and the first stage will generate 46 tons of thrust and the second thrust, uh, the second stage gets 48 tons of thrust thanks to that larger nozzle. Now the third stage is much smaller. It's only 2.6 meters long and it's about 2.6 tons. It'll generate 6.2 tons of thrust for 90 seconds. Unlike the previous stages, this doesn't have any steering capability or any thrust vectoring. It's spin stabilized. So during the launch, the first two stages fire and accelerate the rocket up onto a ballistic trajectory. And they'll typically burn out at around 100 kilometers when the vehicle has an apogee that will continue upwards to reach about 250 kilometers. Now, during the cruise up to that apogee altitude, there's an equipment section on the top there which will... Uh, it basically encompasses the second stage, and you can actually see this in the video that was released. It points the stage in the correct orientation and then spins up the upper stage before letting go. Then when that upper stage finally fires, it spins stabilized and the spacecraft is put into the correct orbit. So the Shavit 1, or the Shavit design, was used to launch the first two satellites, OFEC 1 and 2, and those had masses of about 160 kilograms. And then they introduced an upgrade, the Shavit 1, 
they just stretch that first stage to 7.5 meters long. That's an extra meter long. They also made it wider by five centimeters, 1.35 meters in total. So that raised the total mass to 14 tons and the thrust was uh, up to 62 tons. And this was used for four launches, OFAC 3 through 6, from 1995 to 2004. But two of these launches were unsuccessful. Those satellites were significantly heavier, but you know the final version that flew over the weekend is the Shavit 2. That debuted in 2007. And all they did was they took that stretched first stage and they made the second stage use that stretched model as well. So you can tell the difference or which design of Shavit rocket is using by looking for where the ridge is, where the uh, rocket changes diameter. So yeah, the Shavit 2 has been able to launch 260 kilogram spacecraft by the sound of things. And yeah, that's what they're flying these days. Now, the design of the Shavit rocket actually goes back to uh, Israel's ICBM project called Jericho. That began in the 1960s, and the primary development was originally carried out by Dassault Aviation in France. The first and second stages of the Shavit are literally taken directly from the Jericho 2 missile. In fact, most of what we know about the performance of the Jericho missiles are derived from the performance of the Shavit launch vehicle. The design, incidentally, was also licensed to South Africa, and they produced a series of missiles and rockets called the RSA series. Uh, these were ballistic missiles. They also worked on building a launch vehicle, and they actually had three suborbital launches, which were carried out in 1989 and 1990. But before they reached orbit, the program was cancelled in 1994. There was one other uh, spin-off, or there was an attempt to commercialize the project. Uh, that was a partnership between IAI and Astrium, and that began in 2001. They incorporated, set it up, started advertising it. Uh, curiously, because of US government rules on launch vehicles, they ended up deciding to essentially build a copy of Shavit in the US using US hardware. So one design had a Thiokol Castor 120 motor as the first and second stages, and then the third stage would be a Thiokol Star 48. And all, actually the commercial versions all added this um, a monopropellant hydrazine engine on the top so that they could... Um, well, that would actually help with their orbit trim and orbit insertion accuracy, I, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, this thing was apparently incorporated in 2001, and I haven't seen any updates on it, so I'm going to presume that that whole project is dead. Also, something that keeps coming back is the idea of air launching the Shavit. And, you know, air launch has limited gains. We've also obviously mentioned this before, but the Shavit actually stands to gain a lot if it was air launched. Because, as we pointed out, it normally launches westwards over the Mediterranean. But if you could put it on, say, a Boeing 747 or a Hercules, they could be carried out of Israel, down through the Red Sea and over into the Indian Ocean, and then they could launch eastwards and they could take advantage of the rotation of the Earth. They could get a significant boost from, from that, and they would get a boost from being air-launched. So that actually makes a lot more sense, but I'm not sure that's going to happen either. So, summing up, the Shavit is a curious launch vehicle for many reasons. Partly the history, partly the reasons behind it working, and, you know, honestly, it doesn't actually make very much sense as a launch vehicle for anyone except the Israeli military, where secrecy is very important to their payloads. And at that point, it makes just enough sense to exist. But for heavier payloads that don't need that level of secrecy, they can actually buy launch services from other providers, which have, well, the better situated launch sites. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Shh.